a meta language for multi-phase modularity. I'm John Sterling, and this is joint work with Bob Harper. Software engineering is about the division of labor between users and machines, between clients and servers, between different programmers, and between different modules. Tension lies between abstraction, which embodies the division of labor, and composition, which embodies the harmony of labor. PL theory as a discipline is a particular approach to deal with this tension. In PL theory, we advance linguistic solutions to the contradiction between abstraction and composition. In this talk, we will focus on one particular example of this contradiction, the tension between separate compilation and inlining. Separate compilation is a simple idea, which is to compile each program unit as a function of the other units that it depends on. Separate compilation is attractive for a couple reasons. First of all, compilation is easily parallelizable. Even if one unit depends on another unit, they can both be compiled at the same time because they will both be compiled as a function of the things they depend on. Separate compilation is also attractive from an aesthetic point of view because it enforces the modularity of program units. In principle, even a compiled unit could have its dependencies replaced without changing the overall behavior of the program. Separate compilation also has some problems, especially in regard to composition. First of all, separate compilation can impede the inlining of definitions, which can prevent the compiler from exploiting implementation details. For instance, if the compiler knows how a given piece of code is going to be used, it may be able to generate more efficient code. The main alternative to separate compilation is whole program analysis in the style of the Milton compiler for standard ML. This works great, but it is very slow, and it takes a lot of memory. We would like to put the choice in the programmer's hands as to when and where abstractions get broken for the sake of efficiency. In order to make what we are saying precise, let's discuss program units. Programs are divided into units, which are classified by interfaces that represent their imports and their exports. For example, we may consider the idealized interface to a fragment of the os.filesys module in standard ML standard basis library. It imports some basic data types, including the option data type, which is a functional form of exception control. And it exports an abstract type representing a cursor into a directory, as well as some operations for interacting with this cursor. Interfaces, as we have described them so far, support only importing and exporting abstract types, that is, types whose identity is not known. To support type synonyms, such as type dopath equals string, we need to add more structure to the language of kinds. Stone in 2000 introduced singleton kinds to support exactly this revelation of representation detail. Given a kind k in an element c of k, the singleton kind k maps to c is the type of elements of k that are equal to c. That's a bit of a mouthful, so let's look at an example. We could have exported a constant dough path of singleton kind type maps to string. This has the effect of exporting a new type dough path that is equal to string. In other words, dough path and string are interchangeable in this context. The inlining problem that we discussed earlier is similar, but there we want to reveal representation details to the compiler, but not to the programmer. Singletons, however, reveal implementation details to both. This points to a need for a controlled version of the revelation of implementation details. In ML languages, when you define the same algebraic data type twice, it's actually a different type as far as the type system is concerned. This is called generativity, and is reflected in the language of interfaces by the way that the unit is depending on an arbitrary implementation of the option data structure. As Harper said in his 2013 ML workshop talk, algebraic data types are actually abstract data types. Here, we are abstracting over a type constructor option together with two term constructors, sum and none, and a function implementing a case analysis principle, which will be the target of the elaboration of pattern matching. This is good for modularity, but it's actually terrible for pattern compilation. If we had a lot of nested pattern matches, we would certainly want these to not be implemented by calls to various functions, but instead, implemented by a real pattern compiler. Therefore, inlining the fast path representation is not optional. We saw earlier that singleton kinds can be used to expose the representation of a type. 
both Stone and Lavoie proposed to address the inlining problem for both types and runtime values by adding an analogous singleton type connective. Then, in an interface, we could expose not only the definition of a given type, but also the definition of an element of that type. Unfortunately, this solution is too naive. Singletons reveal representation details to both the programmer and the compiler, which defeats the purpose of introducing abstractions in the first place. The reason we even bother with abstractions is to hide distracting facts from ourselves and from our future selves, who tend to be more ignorant than our present selves. This provides protection from representation coincidences. For instance, an integer that encodes the name of an instruction is not to be confused with one that encodes the length of a packet. A more advanced use of abstraction is to exploit representation invariants. For instance, a batched queue has better amortized complexity than an ordinary queue. And if your code only uses the queue operations, you can be sure that it will not depend observably on the difference between a batch queue and an ordinary queue. Likewise, polymorphic functions between lists can only permute, drop, and duplicate elements. Therefore, there are only so many things that can be incorrect about such a function. For a more extreme example, any polymorphic function into a constant type is itself a constant function. Therefore, abstraction simplifies both programming and verification tasks. While programmers introduce abstraction to protect ourselves from representation details, compilers have the exact opposite needs. Compilers need these representation details in order to generate efficient code. We've seen two solutions so far. One is the use of singletons, a la Stone and Lavoie. This has the benefit of allowing inlining, but it breaks the programmer's abstractions and therefore makes reasoning and programming more difficult. On the other hand, one can simply break all abstractions during compilation after type checking in the style of Milton. The Milton approach is very good because it preserves programmer abstractions during type checking time and produces very efficient code. Unfortunately, it is very slow and it can make your laptop get extremely hot. We propose a unification of these two ideas that puts the decisions, as far as trade-offs are concerned, into the hands of the programmer, negotiated by a phase distinction. Types do a lot of things, but I think that it is worthwhile to pay attention to what Reynolds said types are for. Type structure is a syntactic discipline for enforcing levels of abstraction. Our experience tells us that programmers and compilers are working at very different levels of abstraction. A programmer is introducing a lot of abstractions to protect themselves well from themselves, but the compiler is eliminating these abstractions in order to generate efficient code. Unfortunately, our type systems do not cleanly account for this interaction. We claim that the classic ML family phase distinction provides crucial insight to actually implement Reynolds dictum in a programming language. Traditionally, the phase distinction expresses the non-interference of runtime code on static code. Historically, this was a pivotal notion in the development and design of ML languages and their module systems, and there have been a lot of takes on it in the literature since it was first introduced. But do we still need it? First of all, runtime values increasingly have a static identity, even going back to the strong structure sharing of SML90, as well as the singletons in modern Haskell and the path-dependent types in Scala. Furthermore, while in the past it was unclear how to compile partial and effectful code in the presence of dependent types, there is not presently any obstruction to doing so, as we can see from the experience of the Lean 4 and Idris 2 implementations. Therefore, we fear that the original motivations of the static dynamic phase distinction hold very little force in the year 2021. On the other hand, we have found that other useful phase distinctions abound. For instance, logical relations and parametricity arguments evince a phase distinction between syntax and semantics. This observation lies at the heart of the recent proof of normalization for cubicle type theory by myself and Carlo and Julie, and the recent proof of normalization for multimodal type theory by Gretzer. Bob Harper and I have also used this observation to give the most succinct proofs of representation independence for ML modules that has appeared in the literature so far. There is also a phase distinction between program behavior and program complexity, which New, Grodin, Harper, and I have used to design a cost-sensitive logical framework that can be used to reason about the cost and behavior of programs at the same time. Similarly, Melius and Seilberger have shown that there is a phase distinction between computation and specification, reconstructing the semantic aspects of type refinements.
And in this talk, we are considering a phase distinction between compilation and programming or development. The inlining problem was in essence that singletons break abstraction now, but we want to postpone that to compile time. We will write C for a token representing the compile time phase and introduce a generalization of the singleton types of stone that we considered before. In particular, we will introduce a partial singleton type, tau C maps to E, which is the largest subtype of tau that becomes equivalent to the singleton tau maps to E at compile time. That is, an element of tau C maps to E is going to be an arbitrary element of tau that, if you were in the compile time phase, would have to be equal to E. C is just one of many phases, which we'll arrange into a partial order with a top element. A top element represents now. The total partial singleton, that is, the partial singleton for the top phase, is just the ordinary singleton type. The last change that we have to make is that judgments will now be indexed in a phase, and they will support a contravariant action along the phase partial order. The purpose of the action is the following. If you have an element of a type now, then it corresponds to a compile time element. Let's look at an example of how we can maintain abstraction while supporting efficient representations. We consider a unit that imports abstract types representing the DNS protocol. For instance, we have abstract types for header IDs, opcodes, and so on. These are revealed to the compiler to be unsigned shorts, unsigned cars, and so on but not revealed to the programmer. Then we have a header type, which is transparently the product of all these other types. In our unit, we export a parser that turns bits into headers. We can easily prove that the parser does not observably depend on the representation of opcodes, etc. However, compilation proceeds by re-indexing along the phase transition from now to compile time. Because the header IDs, opcodes, and so on were given by partial singleton types with supports in C, we actually now have a definitional equality between header and the product of all these low-level types, unsigned short times unsigned car times blah blah blah. Therefore, the compiler easily has enough information to choose an efficient unbox representation without breaking programmer abstractions. As we have seen, the phase distinction between compilation and programming is but one of many possible phase distinctions, all of which have identical formal properties. Therefore, we advocate future-proofing ML core languages by indexing them in an arbitrary phase lattice O. There is type structure that corresponds to this phase lattice. First, we have the partial singletons for breaking abstraction in a given phase. Then, we have a phase modality for code that only exists in a given phase. We also have a ceiling modality for erasing code from a given phase. The ceiling modality generalizes the way that sealed modules in standard ML do not have any static component. Finally, one must impose a correctness condition that governs the interaction between these modalities, called fracture. Any type tau can be reconstructed as a subtype of the product of its phase modality with its ceiling modality. This language can be seen to reconstruct all semantic aspects of existing phase distinctions, as well as refinement types as found in liquid Haskell, parametricity and logical relations, and even security typing or information flow control. The debugging problem for functional languages seems to be another pain point that a phase distinction might address. Because we don't have usable debuggers, we tend to use printf debugging for almost all of our problems. Unfortunately, printf debugging tends to be incompatible with abstraction. Let d represent a debugging phase. Then we can add the following computational effect primitive to our language, a debug function that takes a debug phase string to the unit type. First of all, we can prove that for any two debug strings, their debug statements are observationally equivalent. Then from a given abstract type, we can export a debugging function that turns some data into a string. For instance, we could have a debug phase dump header function that turns a header into a string. Debug phase code can be stripped at compile time. In particular, we would change the compilation procedure to re-index not from now to the compile time phase, but from now to the meat of the compile time phase and the negation of the debug phase. 
A similar approach can probably be used to account for profiling data. One of the annoying things about profiling is that when we add counters to our data types, our code can now depend on the values of those counters. Using a combination of the ceiling modality and the phase modality, we can give an account of profiling that ensures that code does not observably depend on the number of times a given function has been called. As I have mentioned before, several applications of our phase distinction meta-language are already well developed, including the new approach to parametricity for ML modules, the normalization proofs for cubicle type theory and multimodal type theory, and the cost-aware logical framework, which is a form of proof-relevant type refinements. Our next steps include developing the connection to security typing and information flow control, studying the elaboration of high-level modular constructs to the meta-language, including a prototype implementation in the CoolTT theorem prover, and adapt the approach to logical relations to handle step indexing. Thanks for your interest in our work.